I welcome you to the 2020 Fall Franciscan Zoom Lectures, hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Dr. Kathleen Warren, OSF, is a Franciscan sister from Rochester, Minnesota. In times when travel is more available, she offers retreats and presentations focused on Franciscan spirituality and interreligious interactions, particularly Muslim Christian. She also serves as the Vicar for Women Religious for the Diocese of San Diego, which she is currently lucky enough to be living in San Diego. Sister Kathy holds a master's degree in pastoral studies from Loyola University, a master's degree in Franciscan studies from St. Bonaventure University, and a doctor of ministry degree in the Graduate Theological Foundation. She is the author of Daring to Cross the Threshold, Francis of Assisi Encounters Sultan Malik Kamel. She, along with Jaysari Hart, is co-producer of the film In the Footprints of Francis and the Sultan, a model for peacemaking. And she is an interviewee on the documentary, The Sultan and the Saint. I welcome you, Sister Kathy. Thank you very much, Michelle. Let me say, may God give you peace. I'd like to begin with a question. How can a story about an event from 800 years ago speak words of wisdom and enlightenment into the darkness in which our world, as Pope Francis points out, is enveloped? Chapter one of Fratelli Tutti lays out how Pope Francis sees the brokenness of today's global scene, a reality of both opulence and extreme poverty, a culture of walls which divides and contributes to a general feeling of frustration, isolation, and desperation. This type of division and lack of respect for human life and commitment to the common good was not unknown to Francis of Assisi. His was a similarly divided world, violent and uncompassionate. Francis of Assisi, like Pope Francis, found the way the, way the world was acting was just unacceptable and set about to make changes. One particularly extraordinary encounter, the Damietta Dialogue, was one attempt to make such changes. I believe this story and the vision of Francis behind that encounter have serious lessons for us as we make our contributions to rebuilding our broken, divided world. So this is how I'd like to proceed tonight. First, we'll consider the story of the extraordinary 1219 encounter with some background information. Next, I'd like to consider some learnings from Francis and the Sultan some building blocks for use in rebuilding our world today. And thirdly, take a look at some late 20th and 21st century sources which align with the wisdom of Francis. And just a note for clarity, when I say Francis, I'll be speaking of Francis of Assisi. And when referring to our current Bishop of Rome, I will always say Pope Francis. That might be helpful. Sometimes it's hard to know which Francis is being referred to. Before getting into the story of the Damietta Dialogue, some background is in order. The all-consuming context of Francis's time and the previous 100 years was the war between the Christians and the Muslims. Francis actually lived through three crusades fought for the liberation of the Holy Land. The Third Crusade when he was only five to 10 years old, the Fourth Crusade when he was 16, and then the Fifth Crusade, the one in which he was involved. In such a climate, it's not hard to understand Francis's original dream of becoming a knight and fighting in the Crusades. But that dream changed dramatically after his year of imprisonment in the filthy prison of Perugia. Assisi's arch rival and enemy just across the valley. After that year, back in Assisi, Francis was despondent and introspective. In today's terms, we would likely say he was a victim of PTSD. 
A series of dreams directed him to prayer and solitude. He sought the advice of a spiritual director and he listened for the voice of God to guide him. After some time, this led Francis to a drastically new and different vocation. The life of an itinerant preacher, a preacher of the gospel of penance and peace. This became Francis's response to the voice he heard from the crucifix, Francis, rebuild my house, which as you see, is falling into ruin. Francis's first biographer tells us that Francis went to Syria to preach the Christian faith and penance. Preaching penance and proclaiming peace was what Francis and the brothers had been doing around and beyond Assisi for 11 years. What did preaching penance mean? To understand that, we need to review Francis's seminal conversion experience among the lepers. Francis writes in his testament toward the end of his life, this is how God led me, Brother Francis, to begin to do penance. When I was in sin, it seemed too bitter for me to see lepers, and God led me among them, and I showed mercy to them. And when I left them, what had seemed bitter to me was turned into sweetness of soul and body. For Francis, the penance he proclaimed is not something initiated by the person. It's very different than our Western notion of giving up something or offering to help someone or even wearing a hair shirt. For Francis, penance is something God does. God led Francis to the lepers. God initiates so that the person can respond. Francis's response, he showed mercy. Afterwards, there was a complete reversal in Francis's life. What had been bitter became sweet. Yes, for the first time in his life, Francis saw the leper not as a repulsive problem to fear, but as a genuine human being. What a drastic change, what a real conversion from what Francis had learned about lepers, that they were people to be ignored, despised, and that they even were devoid of worth. But among the lepers, God opened Francis's eyes and heart to the reality that all persons without exception are endowed with dignity and value, that all have been redeemed by the love of Christ. All are sons and daughters of God. Each person without exception is a brother or sister of Jesus the Christ and thus to one another. Each person is a member of one human family whose origins and destiny is God. We are one. There are no exceptions to this truth. That insight into the universal kinship of all creatures revealed to Francis among the lepers profoundly changed his worldview, his spirituality, and his behavior. Francis realized through the grace of God that Anything that threatens to rupture the bonds of the one human family by placing one human over against another is sin. Sin for Francis, as Michael Cusato explains, is the degradation, the destruction of the human person. To do penance for Francis was to choose to abstain from every action, behavior, and attitude that would divide and destroy the bonds of the human community and violate the sacred character of human life. To do penance was to engage in actions of compassion and goodness that would serve to build up the person and the human community. This vision of universal kinship was not something to talk about. It was something to do, to incarnate. Devastated by the ongoing violent bloodshed and senseless horror on the battlefields that only served to further alienate and destroy the bonds of the human family, redeemed by the love of Christ, Francis was impelled to preach, preach penance in the Levant to both the Crusaders and the Muslims. So Francis goes to the Muslims to show by his actions that those who are called enemy and beast are in fact brothers and sisters 
and part of the human family. He goes to show that no one, not even the most despised by the church, exists outside the human fraternity. He goes to do penance by living in a manner that sustains and respects the bonds that indissolubly bind us all together. This core piece of the Franciscan way of life was not something Francis would be dissuaded from. Francis's fixed resolve to reach the Muslims become clear when we recall that he had two earlier failed attempts to reach the Muslims in 1212 and in 1215. But finally, in 1219, he achieved his goal of taking this message of penance and peace to the Muslims in hopes of achieving its conclusion, his radical vision of universal kinship. The clarity of Francis to rebuild the house by healing and reconciling broken relationships and eradicating from the world the evils of greed, violence, oppression, aggression, indifference, and neglect appear obvious to us today. But it seems that it wasn't that obvious in Francis's day. And what about today? Is his insight not aligned with the way in which Pope Francis sees our world with dark clouds over a closed world and the call that Pope Francis proclaims for each of us to do something about it? The vision of Francis is not a theory but it's a way to relate to each other. It's a vision of God's own original intention that all be one. So here we are in the Sultan's encampment in the city of Damietta on the Nile Delta, but we're getting a little bit ahead of the story. So let's go back to how Francis got to Damietta. Francis and a number of his priors joined a troop of crusaders who left for where the, ex, the cross is here. The crusaders left from the port of Ancona um, and they traveled through the Mediterranean Sea down here to the port of Acre, the Christian port that was just northwest of Jerusalem. Acre was held by the Christians. Of course, Jerusalem was in the hands of the Muslims. And then from Acre, they went to Damietta. Now, why did he go to Egypt? Why Damietta? Especially if the purpose of the Crusades was to regain the Holy Land for the Christians. Well, the simple truth was that Damietta, about 150 miles north of Cairo by car, had major strategic importance for the Muslims. For the Muslims, Cairo was the key to the success against the Crusaders because of its wealth from trade, agriculture, and population. Crusaders understood the tactical importance of the Nile Delta for the Muslims. Thus, the key to conquering Jerusalem was to control the port city of Damietta, the gateway to the Levant. And the fifth and sixth crusades, which spanned 12 years, fought for the control of this one strategic city, 12 years. One final piece of significant background uh, before we get into the story, and that has to do with the involvement of Pope Innocent III. His involvement in the Fifth Crusade was unusual, and its, port its importance is not to be minimized. Wanting to avoid another disastrous crusade defeat, the Pope himself assumed complete leadership of the Fifth Crusade and he put all the power and the wealth of the papacy behind it. He spared nothing in garnering the support of the entire empire. And his effort included soliciting powerful crusade preachers to rev up intense fervor and support among the people for this cause. And the crusade preachers quoted one of the most renowned spiritual writers of their time to assuage the consciences of the people in the justification of killing the Muslims. And this is what the crusade preachers would preach to the people. The night of Christ may kill with great confidence and die with greater confidence, for he serves himself when he dies and he serves Christ when he kills the enemy. If he kills an evildoer, meaning a Muslim, 
He is not the killer of a human being, but he's a killer of evil. So on the battlefield, it's not even homicide that's being committed. It's really just malicide. Let's return to Damietta. When Francis arrived in Damietta, the Crusaders had been on the banks of the Nile for over a year, unable to capture the city or rout the Muslims. Francis was in the Crusader camp after a gruesome battle and their staggering defeat on August 29, 1219. Following the battle, Sultan Malek el Kamel, the leader of the Muslims, offered a peace treaty, in, um, including an offer to give the Crusaders Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be given back to the Crusaders along with money to rebuild it. And in exchange, the Crusaders would need to leave Egypt. The offer caused great division among the crusade leaders. King John of Jerusalem, the military leader, the Germans and others wanted to accept that treaty. But Cardinal Pelagius, the papal uh, spiritual leader and most of the clergy and the Italians opposed it. Of course, King John would want to get his city back and he spoke in favor of the treaty. The Italians, though, didn't want to lose their lucrative trade opportunities with Egypt, and they agreed with the papal position. There was great disagreement between these two leaders, the military and the spiritual leader, but it was clear that Cardinal Pelagius, the personal representative of the Pope right there on the battlefield, had the final word. So the fighting between the Muslims and the Crusaders stopped while the Muslims waited for an answer. A truce of up to 21 days ensued. And during that time, we know that Francis and Brother Illuminato crossed the enemy line into the Muslim camp. Francis at this time was 37 years old and the Sultan was just two years older, 39 years old. As unusual as Francis was among the Christians in his fervor for peace for all people, so too was this Sultan unusual among the Muslims. Nephew of the famous Saladin, Sultan El Kamel was um, known as the Sultan who wanted to make peace with the Christians, and he offered peace treaties many times. This made him a very unpopular Sultan among the Muslim forces, but among the people he was revered. He was a good and a just ruler for Muslims, for Christians, and for all the people in his realm. He was an educator and a builder of schools. And he was a learned man, and he regularly entertained scholars of every discipline from other parts of the world, sharing meals and conversation to the enlightenment of all the participants. He was also known to care for the needs of prisoners after battles. We have copies of letters from former prisoners written to thank him for his kindness and for the ample food he provided after their complaints. Indeed, he and Francis shared much in common, including their love of and service to the God of Abraham that each of them knew. To say that the encounter between these two men who dialogued in the midst of such a bloody war was astounding is a huge understatement. The encounter itself is recorded in um, three different crusade chronicles and in Franciscan sources by two um, two of the writers, both Chilano and Bonaventure. No Muslim record has ever been found. No written reports about the conversations they might have had exist. However, we can conclude that the encounter was one of respect, open, openness, curiosity, non-judgment, and a willingness to listen and enter into dialogue. We know this way of interacting with others was the way of life for the friars. It was also the way of life for followers of Muhammad. The trademark greeting of the friars, as we know, may God give you peace. So very similar to the Muslim greeting, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Their encounter centered likely in discussion on God and God's ways, 
God's ways for the world. And it probably, as they spoke with each other, united their spirits and their hopes for peace, God's peace for the world. Indeed, they found common ground as they shared their deepest truths. Some scholars posit that El Camel was likely attracted to this humble poor man from a season because of his Sufi-like characteristics. We know that this Sultan was very um, pro-Sufi um, in terms of the Muslim mystical tradition. And um, he saw in Francis something that resembled that kind of mystic, prayerful, contemplative um, connection with God. When I visited Damietta on our scouting trip for the Franciscan media film, we visited a seventh century mosque that was being reconstructed. And I wondered, did Francis visit the mosque of Damietta? Did he pray there? I think it really could have been likely. Recall the images that we've seen recently of Popes John Paul II, Benedict, and Francis praying in mosques in the midst of their Muslim brothers and sisters. Francis and Illuminato could have been with the Muslims for the entire month of September. We know the great reverence that Francis had for churches. Would not a Muslim house of prayer have caught his attention? Was he not impressed with their five times of prayer each day? He certainly alludes to their prayer practices in his writings after he returns to Assisi. And in Assisi, we have the horn for calling people to prayer that Francis may have received from the Sultan. What a great symbol of their encounter is a prayer horn. And now I'd like to move into part two, the learnings, the building blocks for rebuilding our world. I believe there is great wisdom for our world in the message of the interaction between Francis and the Sultan. These were two men of peace, two giants of peace in a world embroiled in violence. That these two kindred spirits met and that their story is now being proclaimed and utilized for peace is remarkable. A story initially covered up and even reported in a distorted way for centuries has truly come into its own. Francis's message of how to go among or be with the other provides a model with a valuable message for a way to address the conflicts and divisions rampant in today's world. Rooted in the gospel values of Jesus, Francis's approach was to relinquish the either or exclusive mentality which seeks power over in lieu of a reality that embraced the many in a universal inclusivity where power is placed at the service of the other. Francis and the, Ma and the Sultan modeled such a way. In Damietta, both men made choices. Would Francis be, be received with hospitality or executed? Would they listen to each other? Would they be open to the truth of the other? Would they allow themselves to be impacted by what the other shared? The extraordinary encounter of these two men offers our world a model for how to build a world where all people together promote, quote, a culture of tolerance, acceptance of others, and of living together peacefully in order to contribute significantly to reducing many economic, political, and environmental problems that weigh so heavily on a large part of humanity. That's a quote taken from a document on human fraternity um, written by Pope Francis and Imam Tayyib, who, whom I will speak about in a little bit. But the behavior of Francis and the Sultan, their wisdom, demonstrates a way to stop division and destruction and to simply get, a, get on with the work of building a world of peace. For that, mere tolerance of the other is not enough. Serious commitment to accepting the other and openness to listening to and learning from the other is essential. I'd like to highlight three building blocks or behaviors that are core to the vocation of Francis for repairing God's church. And these basic building blocks 
to speak to a life of daily conversion, acceptance of our human condition, and commitment to a vision of universal kinship. The first building block is openness to conversion. In today's world, exclusive ideologies that have no room for differences seek either separation from those who are other or conversion of the other to the said exclusive ideology. But Francis suggests a different kind of conversion as the starting point for living in our world. This is a conversion that seeks continual surrender to God's will of continually responding yes to God's invitations. For Francis, that initial huge conversion experience was saying yes to going among the lepers. This conversion is based on a contemplative stance. When you listen enough to God to know what God is really inviting you to do, that's what a life of penance is, letting God take the initiative which leads always to new opportunities. Gazing on the face of the leper, we remember Francis found himself turned outside of himself and toward the other, the rejected, the feared people of society. And there he found two profound truths, what it was to look upon the face of God and the true meaning of his humanity. In the leper, he actually saw the face of God. And in the leper, he actually saw his own humanness. And with his eyes and heart opened, he saw with compassion <clears throat> and he understood his own vulnerability. He realized that being human was intrinsically bound up in being brother to everyone. That is in being in relationship. And that new insight and that change of heart that Francis experienced identified encounter with the other as indispensable with one's humanity. I cannot be me without being in relationship with you. The prevailing worldview at the time of Francis was not about being in relationship with the other. It would be known as an intolerant worldview not unknown in our world today. An intolerant worldview is closed to dialogue with those who are different, whether you're lepers or heretics or Muslims or Jews or Democrats or Republicans. It's closed to those who are the other. It uses force to control others, and it's marked in its extreme by arrogance, bigotry, and rage. Francis, again, offers an alternative way to live. So seemingly simple, yet so hard to achieve. It seems that Francis is one of the very few people in history that totally embraced the human condition. He understood that we were intended to be human and nothing else. This wisdom came from his own contemplation on the life of Christ. God's choice to enter into the human condition fully and accept all its frailty, <clears throat> woke in Francis a deep sensitivity and awareness about the human condition. And he exhorted his followers to embrace the vulnerability of the human condition as he himself did, accepting the limitations of the human condition in a stance of nonviolence, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Such a life is characterized by humility, patience, and unconditional mercy. Always be merciful, was Francis's directive. Francis wanted to live as Jesus did, with unconditional love, absolute acceptance of the other, and unqualified forgiveness. The first call to every person is simply to be authentically human, to be what each is created to be, and nothing more. The third building block proposed by Francis after conversion and accepting our human condition is that of universal kinship, the interconnectedness of one human family and of all creation, most eloquently proclaimed by Francis in his masterpiece, The Canticle of Creation. In this popular prayer poem, 
this charter of peace, Francis offers a picture of the entire universe, which acknowledges and celebrates interdependence and unity in diversity. Francis views diversity as a critical element in God's plan, something which reflects the very being of God. The Canticle of the Creatures celebrates the reconciled nature of the cosmos as it identifies the authentic nature of each particular element of creation. For Francis, the essence of the human condition is bound up in the primary activity of Christ, which is the work of pardoning and reconciling. Therefore, the primary activity of the human must be pardoning, reconciling, and bearing with our infirmities, our limitations. When we humans embrace this truth as our essence, we find our rightful place in God's creation and make our unique contribution to the ongoing creation. And therein is found our true peace, the peace that is of God and is God's intention for all God's creatures. Well, with those three building blocks, let's move on fast forward into the 21st into the 21st century and the 20th century. About 20 years ago, during one of my earliest presentations on this topic, an insightful question was asked. So when did the church finally catch up with the vision of Francis? That was a great question. The answer was at Vatican II. Yes, for some of us here in the audience here tonight, the answer is in our lifetime. It took over 750 years for the official teaching of our church to articulate the wisdom of the gospel known to and espoused by Francis of Assisi. The climate and attitude of our church today regarding interaction with other religions and the faithful of other world religions and interdependence with all people could not be more different than it was in the 13th century. For those who have grown up in a post-Vatican II church, like you, Michelle, it's hard to imagine the quantum leap that the Second Vatican Council brought forth regarding relations with world religions. To call it a revolution is really mild. Let me briefly identify just three major contributions to our renewed approach to interreligious relations and therefore to peace building in the world. 1964, the groundbreaking declaration from the Second Vatican Council, Nos Prietate, on relation of the church with non-Christian uh, non religions totally redirected the church's interaction with world religions. I find this landmark text, of course, to be an authentic expression of Francis's vision of universal kinship where everyone belongs and everyone has a place. We could hardly find a more drastic difference between the message of the Second Vatican Council about other religions and their followers from the um, message of the Fourth Lateran Council that Francis needed to respond to. Nostria Tate boldly proclaims some radical new truths for us. Talk about opening the windows. The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these world religions. What a bold and different statement that is. She regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings which, though differing in many respects from the ones she holds and sets forth, nonetheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all people. All religions, all people have a ray of that truth, very, very sincerely and truly. The church therefore urges its members to enter into dialogue and collaboration with members of other religions, just as we see Pope John Paul II do with the Dalai Lama. Let Christians therefore acknowledge, preserve, and encourage the spiritual and moral truths found among non-Christians together with their social life and their culture. The church has a high regard for the Muslims. 
They worship God who is one. They submit themselves as Abraham submitted himself to God. For not acknowledging Jesus as God, they revere him as a prophet. They honor Mary, his virgin mother, and call on her with devotion. Now, during the centuries, not a few quarrels and hostilities have arisen between us. But now is the time for us to forget the past and work sincerely for mutual understanding, for social justice, as well as for peace and for freedom. And in Article 5, we have these strong and bold, almost terrifying words. The church reproves as foreign to the mind of Christ any discrimination against people or harassment of them on the basis of their race, color, condition in life, or religion. This is foreign to the mind of Christ. And the church begs the faithful Christian to maintain good fellowship among the nations and to be at peace with all people, and in that way, to be true daughters and sons of the Father who is in heaven. This was a bold proclamation. It's obviously the shortest um, writing of the second of the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council, but it's powerful in what it calls us to. This is an agenda that's nearly six decades old. And it's certainly in need of coming more fully to life. So now we're going to fast forward to the papacy of Pope um, John Paul II, who created and sustained enormous changes in interreligious matters by simply doing something as simple as a handshake with the with the Jewish rabbi of Rome, something that hadn't happened for <laughs> 2,000 years when he stepped into that, that Jewish synagogue. Um, his commitment to interreligious dialogue was monumental. He affirmed the goodness and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the religions and their faithful, and he called for the need to work together to bring justice and peace into our world. And of course, his most profound statement, as far as I'm concerned, occurred on October 27, 1986, when he invited the leaders of the world religions to gather in Assisi, not Rome, to come together to pray for and to witness to peace for the entire world. It's called the Assisi Experience, and it represented a new start in encounters among the religions. And the event itself has been heralded as the most significant ecumenical interreligious event since the Second Vatican Council, a watershed event in the area of interreligious activity, a basic landmark in the field of interreligious dialogue, a new horizon of dialogue, a gesture without precedent, and even the inauguration of a planetary ecumenism. The Assisi experience had an explosive spiritual power from which sprang new peace energies, and the repercussions are being strongly felt yet today. 34 years later, an annual event commemorating this gathering is organized by the Sant'Egidio Committee of Rome every year. But not only once did Francis, uh, Pope uh, John Paul II, bring world religious leaders to Assisi, he did it four times, 86, 93, 99, and 2002. Did it in uh, conjunction with significant events that either had happened or were going to happen. He powerfully moved forward the interreligious agenda. And now we fast forward to our current Pope, Pope Francis. Here he is celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Assisi experience in 2016, right there back in Assisi um, in front of the uh, Basilica of St. Francis. Of his dozens of foreign trips, many have been to Muslim majority countries. 800 years after Francis of Assisi crossed the sea to visit the Sultan of Egypt, another Francis traveled by plane to become the first Pope ever to visit the Arabian Peninsula, the heartland of the Muslim world. Like Francis of Assisi, Pope Francis's journey was made to promote peace and harmony between the followers of different religions, and particularly between Christians and Muslims. 
Peace was the theme of this three-day visit where he had been invited to participate in an international interfaith meeting on human fraternity organized by Muslim leaders. As he had done throughout his papacy, Pope Francis addressed his Muslim hosts as brothers, calling the grand imam of the historic Al-Azhar Mosque of Cairo, Sheikh Al-Tayyib, my friend and my brother. This was actually the fifth time these two men had met. Both men acknowledged the significance of this, quote, opportunity to advance interreligious dialogue and mutual understanding between the followers of both religions and all religions in the year that marked the 800th anniversary of the historic meeting between Francis of Assisi and Sultan Malek al Kamil. The conference produced the document on human fraternity, which is a guide on advancing a culture of mutual respect. And I highly recommend you getting a hold of it and reading it. It's not long at all. That statement became the basis for establishing the higher committee of human fraternity, which continues to foster a culture of dialogue and encounter. And you see on the screen, uh, there's a website. That's a very impressive website and gives you lots of hope for peace in the world among the religions. Um, forhumanfraternity.org, you can't see it, forhumanfraternity.org. Pope Francis revealed upon his return to Rome from this very meeting that he was committing to write his next encyclical on this same topic, on human fraternity, and thus are the origins of Fratelli Tutti. The world pandemic impacted the content of the encyclical but it remained framed in the lens of establishing a culture of encounter with the other. The influence of both St. Francis and Imam Taib are recognized in the opening and closing pages of the document. This saint of fraternal love, simplicity, and joy who inspired me to write the encyclical Laudato Si prompts me once more to devote this new encyclical to fraternity and social friendship. Pope Francis identified the demeanor of Francis with the Sultan, not waging a war of words aimed at imposing doctrines, but simply spreading the love of God, inspiring, excuse me, inspiring the vision of a radically transformed society. He states very simply, Francis has inspired these pages. And he also recognizes Imam al Taib, with whom I met in Abu Dhabi, where we declared that God has created all human beings equal in rights, duties, and dignity, and has called them to live together as brothers and sisters. This was no mere diplomatic gesture, but a reflection born of dialogue and common commitment. The present encyclical takes up and develops some of the great themes raised in that document that we both signed. And that document is referring to on human development. In fact, one commentary that I read on Fratelli Tutti says, it's as though the encyclical was the work of four hands rather than two, meaning the hands of both Francis and El Tayyip. Pope Francis states his purpose in writing. I offer this social encyclical in hopes that in the present day attempts to eliminate or ignore others, we may prove capable of responding with a new vision of fraternity and social friendship that will not remain at the level of words. Although I have written it from the Christian convictions that inspire and sustain me, I sought to make this reflection an invitation to dialogue among all people of goodwill. And there he stands in front of that marvelous sculpture that he commissioned that is currently in St. Peter's Square. It's my desire that in this time, by acknowledging the dignity of each human person, we can contribute to the rebirth of a universal aspiration to fraternity. 
the rebirth of a uni universal aspiration to fraternity, fraternity between all men and women. And moving into my conclusion. Imagination. Imagination is critical if a new world of universal kinship is to be built. Francis was a man with a heightened sense of imagination and a tremendous ability to dream new dreams, kingdom size. Imagination and dreams allow one to redefine the world and bring forth conditions that reflect the vision of the peaceable kingdom described by Isaiah or the reconciled creation that Francis described in his canticle. Francis of Assisi dared to cross boundaries and move into uncharted territory, new relationships, in order to rebuild a fractured, wounded world. Francis's behaviors and words spoke to a creation he imagined as reflective of God's dwelling place, God's house. It's apparent that Francis imagined a world where hearts are disarmed, where each person fully reconciled with himself or herself is a place of welcome for all others, just as they are. He imagined a world where people remember their humanity as it was given in the beginning, a world where mercy is lavished upon the other, a world where littleness is the only power, a world in which people speak together about God's faithfulness in the past and God's promise to be with God's people in the future, and a world where all elements of creation are considered to be brother or sister as our native and indigenous peoples understand and celebrate Mother Earth and our entire universe. Yes, Francis could imagine a cosmos at peace where all know that their deepest security is rooted in the relationship with the other, where each one knows herself or himself as sister, brother to all. Indeed, universal kinship. Such imagination and dreaming allows for a world that God envisions, a world not of alienation, but of peace and universal kinship. Francis and the Sultan show us what has um, become accepted as normal is actually abnormal, and that what is abnormal can become the norm, that it is possible for people of different backgrounds and beliefs to come together and contribute to a healed world a world of kinship and social friendship. After 800 years, I believe that the, Francis, the message of Francis and the Sultan is still a radical message of universal kinship, and it proclaims a new way of relating. There can be no true peace in our world unless people are willing to move out and embrace the other as brother, as sister. May many find it desirable to investigate together the radical message of peace spoken by a lesser brother and a noble sultan from the 13th century and proclaimed in a new text by Pope Francis in conjunction with his brother, Imam al Tayyib. Their singular universal message proclaimed through dramatic dialogues and extraordinary encounters 800 years ago and in our time invites and needs each of us to do what is ours to do, to incarnate it in today's world. As both of our Francis's and their dialogue partners proclaim, brothers, sisters all. Amen, so be it. Amen, so be it. Wow, well done. Uh, thank you, Sister Kathy, for your lecture, which opens up that radical call to universal kinship rooted in the actions and words of St. Francis and Pope Francis. May many in our world find ways to embrace this vision. Uh, a reminder that this opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology Development Department, but uh, let's please give a collective applause to Sister Kathy. Well done.